It's even as they say, all is not what it seems. You better believe it as we join Paul Daniels live at Halloween. Part of darkest Kent tonight. We're in Allington Castle, and if you think this is strange, wait a few moments and see what we do when we celebrate Halloween. Where tonight, yes, we are going to celebrate Halloween. Beside me there stand 12 candles and it's Halloween. 12 is just not enough. So we add the 13th candle. Now in adding a 13th candle we start the Halloween happening. But of course 13 candles are not good enough. They should be lit. <laughs> And so the mysterious starts to happen. And in the hall here, I have friends and strangers. Some people I've never met, and some people I will meet as the evening goes on. Some old friends, of course. And uh, amongst those old friends, I'm delighted to say, some faces that you'll recognize as you sit at home, I hope, with the doors locked. All right, because you never know on Halloween, which is, which is ride tonight? Spirits roam. Over here, we've got the lovely Pat Brake. Over there, I can see Gloria Honeyford. Here, we have a cluster of mayors, mayoresses, lady mayors, I don't know. They're from the surrounding towns, because we're very close to Maidstone. Over here, of course, we've got Robert Powell, an old friend. We've even got dotted about one or two members of magical circles. And here, we have another man with a chain. It's more modern to have a handle fitted. All right? <laughs> so you should know that. So I don't really know what's going to happen, except I'll tell a few stories, invite a guest along, and try to show you some of the magic and the mystery of Halloween. Now this is a walled castle, and around, of course, there is a moat. And in the old days, they used to have little houses in the walls, on the walls, and fortunately here, they have a couple of small little houses left. Now, how old what I'm about to show you is, I have no idea. It's so clean because it was all wrapped up in paper. Some child, who knows, had put it in here. This is a little toy box. We found it in the attic just round the corner. There's so many nice little things in here. We have got here a little Victorian doll, very pretty. Isn't she beautiful? We've got some of these. These are lettered... Um, blocks and presumably the child would have played with those we have <laughs> a tiny little teddy now he looks quite modern doesn't he really and this this there were two toys in the same style this is a pop gun but this was special this was the repeater model <laughs> good isn't it yeah really good that I found this I didn't know what it was this was um, 
I thought maybe they had big hens or something for an egg cup. But then I found this and I realized, could you tip that box up and show me it's empty? I realized that this was all part and parcel of the same thing. Do you remember when you used to throw it up in the air and try to catch on the string? But the string was broken. So I put them back in the box and, um, oh, I tell you what, if we put this, uh, where? If we put it um, over here, more this side, and put the ball well away from it, because something strange happened on that night. Stay there. Now, something very strange. Now, they're well apart. The box is a bit tipsy. Be careful how you walk, because it starts to roll. It just did. Now, this is a record that was also in the attic, an old gramophone, and this is a record, a children's record, of, what is it? Ringer, ringer roses. Nice, that. Do you remember that when you were a child? Ringer, ringer roses. It's from the time of the plague in London. The ring of ring of roses referred to the circles of spots and scabs that used to come on your face when you got the plague. A pocket full of posies was carried, and people walked like this all the time, to take away the smell of the rotting dead in the streets of London. Some children's nursery ran. And then, of course, a tissue, a tissue, we all fall down. It was the sign of the plague. Now, these toys were so immaculate that perhaps the child that had them died early. Because as I played that, out of the corner of my eye, I saw a movement across the room. And something strange started to happen. And as the children sang, I was aware of this movement, couldn't really place it. And then I saw, of course, what you're seeing now. Very strange. And then I stopped the record and I came across to the box and its contents. I took out the ball. Catch. It's only a ball. I took the vase. A bit hard to catch, but still catch. It's only a vase. You can actually do me another favor. I would like somebody possibly over that side. You can take him, pass it over. Would you destroy the box? Because I don't want it to ever happen again. And now, <laughs> last year, ladies and gentlemen, we did a Halloween show. Last year, we had a great guest on that Halloween show. He's with us again from America. Please welcome Mr. Eugene Berger. Well, how nice to be here. Halloween is my favorite holiday, and you'll see why. I've got something to show you. Some old tarot cards. Each one is different, and there are 13 in all. Perhaps you would give me a number between five and ten. Mm, let's say seven. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. One of the nicest things about being a magician is you meet some rather weird people. <laughs> Once I met a lady who told me that she was a witch. And she gave me this, a little folder filled with pieces of paper. Now she said that these papers are used in a bizarre ritual. 
You like it already, I can tell. <laughs> it is called the ritual of the pentagram, as in the old werewolf movies. And so I'm going to draw a five-pointed star, a pentagram, on two of the pieces of paper. Now the next thing we need to do, we need to select a victim. How quickly she turned on you. <laughs> You're not going to be the victim, that would be much too heavy. The card chosen at random will be the victim. The sun, warmth. That's me. Being good sports, we're going to let the victim hide. Now, hold your hand on top of it. Now, the next thing we need to do is we need to make a representation of the victim. And we're going to use the oldest method known, using the victim's name to conjure up a spell. Now, of course, you can't have a bizarre ritual without a candle. <laughs> you saw the movie, I could tell. <laughs> well, let's recap. First of all, we selected a victim, and then we made this representation of it. The last thing you need to do, obviously, is we need to inflict upon the representation some hideous form of pain. I've always liked fire, too. <laughs> I cast a spell of pain. Flashy, huh? <laughs> Did you feel it? Not much. Move your hand. Did you? I hope so. <laughs> One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen. Ooh, <laughs> clever. <laughs> Thank you, Eugene. We'll be back with him in a little while. Now, almost prehistory now, because we're going to go back, some think, to the time of the ancient Egyptians, and some do not. Some say that the boxes before me belonged to quite modern magicians, uh, modern in our terms, uh, like Nostradamus or Cagliostro, someone of that nature. Um, now, what I'm going to use, I best explain everything here. We have two ancient boxes. We've got an old collection bag from uh, the chapel next door. We've got this, which is a pyramid. And you'll be seeing another one of these in a little while. But that is obviously empty. There's nothing in there. And it's obviously only a model. Now, many people believe in what they call now pyramid power. Can I just push that over near you? Thank you very much. And this is a piece of carpet that has nothing strange about it at all except that. People believe magicians use trapdoors, so I said if we put a carpet there, people will know there's no trapdoor. Now, there is in here, uh, this is called the winged scarab. There are several things in here which I'd like to show you. There's um, one of these, it's a tiny piece of papyrus, and I roll it over and over so that you can see there's absolutely nothing on that whatsoever. And we're going to roll it nice and tight. Once we've got it nice and tight like this, and we tie it off, then we place it whoops, just to one side, like so. Now, also in here, there is a piece of cord. I can show you that. Piece of cord. Maybe you'd like to get hold of that, Robert, and just make. Now, it looks as just like a piece of string. Mm -hmm. But if you look very carefully at the ends of it, you will find that it has been... I can't get this out. There we are. Uh, it has been a, a piece of hair. In fact, lots of pieces of hair. They've been plaited together. All right? And perhaps you are holding the hair of Cleopatra, in which case she'd have been the earliest blonde Egyptian. I'll tell you, right? <laughs> now, um, would you have that? That's an, a small amulet. In fact, would, can you just hold it like that so the, the camera sees it? Again, it's the winged scarab, yes? A little, little piece of metal on the top to tie it off with. And could you mark that in some way using this file, all right? Front, back, wherever you want, uh, so that you would recognize it if ever you see it again. All right. And this, while she's doing that, is a piece of, uh, of a strange tree. This is a tanner leaf. 
then the Egyptians believed that this brought life. We'll put that there. Okay? Now, have you marked that in okay. such a way as you can see? Can yes. you see the mark? Yes. You can. Good. Now, you are happy with that. Stretch it out before you and just thread it through there. There you go, you did it. And tie the ends in a good, tight knot. And once you've done that, you will then be able to... Yeah, it's, it's not easy. Lower it back into the box. There you go. Good. You lower that in there. Okay? Beautifully done. But then we would expect nothing else. <laughs> a piece of parchment and a tanner leaf purchased for sixpence. I know the joke. <laughs> right. Now what we do is we just close the box down. We now do nothing at all to the box. We give it to Debbie. Debbie takes that over to the other table where there's a similar outfit. <clears throat> there is a pyramid. Please, somebody at the table, tip the pyramid up. Look at it underneath. You will find there's nothing at all there. And Debbie can place the box on the table and you can now close that down. This box is different. This one has absolutely nothing in it at all. You can see that, and so can you, and I don't know whether the people at home can see very dark here. So, what we do is we close the lid again, like so, and we take this, which is the pyramid, and we roll it over and place it on here. Now, no one can get at the pyramid. In here, there are a lot of little tablets and stones. Would you like to just reach inside and take one? Don't let anybody see what it is. Just keep it in your hand, keep hold of it, fine. Okay, happy with that? You've got one. There were several in there, you just took one. Keep it out on the table, then everybody can see. Nothing gets out of it. We don't need the file anymore. Good. You marked an amulet, papyrus with nothing on it, tanner leaf, a chosen tablet. Nothing can travel through time and space. That's what they say. And yet, ancient Egyptian, ancient magician, I don't know, something mysterious always starts to happen. That was strange. Why was it strange? The thing that you hold is an amulet. There are many of those in the world. It's a winged scarab. You hold, well, a stone with a marking on it, and we don't know what that is. Now, the reason we don't know what that is is because if I can just tip all of these out onto the table, like that, you can see that they are all different. The people sitting around the table can see hieroglyphics on all of them, all different. Oh, the box, by the way, in here. Well, this box is as it was in the beginning of time. This box contains absolutely nothing at all. So, 
something strange did happen. Debbie, could you bring me back the other box? Because it is impossible for things to travel through time and space. And yet somebody must have cured that problem because in the other pyramid, whether you believe in pyramid power or not, has been resting a box in which several items were placed. Now, one of those items was, in fact, a winged scarab amulet, and yet, would you reach in, Robert, and just take out the piece of hair that has been plaited to look like cord, and you will find there is no amulet on it whatsoever. Did you, in fact, now you can look at it closely in the light, did you mark that amulet? That is the amulet you marked, yes, it is? It is, yes. Good. Now, also, there's something else we don't know. Uh, I can't get it out. Uh, Robert's already looked in. There is only one papyrus in here, as indeed there was in the beginning. Would you like to open your hand now and look at whichever symbol you chose from the bag? That is called an ankh, all right? It is the key of life, all right? The symbol of life. And now, on here, there is an ankh. <laughs> the symbol of life. <laughs> of the family. Ooh, spooky. Back to Eugene Berger, of course, our guest from America. Nice round of applause for Eugene. It's over there. And now. Highlights in the history of the late Middle Ages, told with a pack of cards. Part 20, the Inquisition, always a popular favorite. The two of spades will represent an exceedingly efficient instrument of medieval torture. The king of spades, a somewhat confused resident of the community who has been accused falsely of heresy. I will play the part of Torquemada. <laughs> the device is prepared behind the victim's back, thereby increasing witless anxiety. You get to be Torquemada's assistant. <laughs> the Inquisition begins. Do you confess your heresy? No? Great. <laughs> Perhaps this will loosen your tongue. Actually, the victim's tongue has been removed, so the anguished cries do not detract from the merriment of the moment. <laughs> now, you would imagine that the victim would be inserted into the device. No. The device is inserted into the victim much more painful, <laughs> and it is rubbed against the very spine. On good days, you can get the victim to turn around, but on very good days, you can get them to turn inside out. Not only that, you can also get them to turn outside in. And not only that, you can get them to face half one way and half the other. Rather like going in two directions at the same time, something you intuitively grasp. <laughs> A quick break of the spine with your right hand. Hold him right there. And with your left, little ah, oh, there you go. We'll do right left therapy. Great. <laughs> and with your hand, hold him right there. Just the, just the car. Ready? Don't move. This is my favorite part. You'll be able to hear the bones. <laughs> the victim is beside himself. But look, half the card is facing out. The other half is facing in. Open them up. And that's how it's done. <laughs> Amazing. How does he do it? I don't know. Now, this is a magnet, a bar magnet. And this is a cutlery that this lady uh, found up her husband's sleeve, I believe. Anyway, this, is, this really is a magnet, and what I'm holding in my hand is a planchette. 
a piece of wood that has to be cut from the very heart of the tree. This is not magnetic in any way whatsoever, it doesn't matter where you touch it, and that is important for you to understand because a planchette is used rather like we use a glass. It, it's, um, could you just hold that for me? A moment, thank you. A planchette is placed on one of these. This is a Ouija board, okay? And when it is placed on there, as you can see, it will fall off. The lady's checking the magnet is against the back. Yes? Yes. yes. But of course, it doesn't matter where you put it. This is a non-magnetic piece of timber. Right. I'll just get rid of that for a second. And now we are going to contact those who have gone before. May I use your chair, sir, to just rest this on? Thank you. Uh, no, no, not good enough. Um, it slides horizontal. You've won the prize, you get to sit down again. Um, would you mind, madam, I need somewhere where the cameras can see it. So if you wouldn't mind going that way and uh, letting Debbie through, because Debbie tends to be a medium. Right. Now that's resting nicely on the chair. Good. And what I'm going to do now is I'm going to place this on the, on the Ouija board. We. Oui? Ja, we, oui, ja, yes, yes, German and French mixture. And what I do is I say, spirits, spirits, come amongst us and take hold of the planchette. And I leave go, and the spirits um, are not with us. Uh, but as you can see, it's just a piece of wood. And what would you expect on a cold night in the middle of Kent? Spirits, no. It's not working. Okay, we'll try it again. Now, spirits, here we go. Spirits, spirits, if you are there, take this planchette. Take it and tell me you are there. Tell me you are there. Spirits, tell me you are there. Tell me you are there. Now, it is moving in a strange fashion. Perhaps, it says, but obviously the spirits are with us. So, it's now... Yes, perhaps. It's, I think it's looking. There's S, U. Yes, they are obviously there. Now, I'm going to remove this from the board again. Now, look at this. If I take this from the board, the power of the spirit is no longer with us. It's no longer with us at all. And yet, if I place it on the board and say, Spirits, take this planchette. Take it. You are there. There is a man to my immediate left. Would you say that he was handsome? <laughs> Would you say he was handsome? No. Uh-uh, uh-uh, no, we're going past no to yes. The spirits think you are handsome. There is a lady on the other side in a silver top. Do you have any children, madam? How many do you have? One. How many children is the lady going to have? <laughs> are you there? Um, remembering it is, of course, a cold night. <laughs> How many are you going to have? She thinks you're going to have seven. No, three, no, two. It's pointing at two, which is not bad, not bad at all. Would someone like to ask the spirit a question at all? Um, Pat, there you go. No, tell you what, not out loud. Just whisper it to Debbie, because in truth, Debbie is the medium here. I'll move it forward a little away from the wall so that people can... Okay, we have a question. Okay, we have a question. Spirits, can you answer the question? Probably get a no, because mm. you never know. The spirits are trying to answer the question now. The answer is a clear perhaps. Perhaps yes. That's nice. That's a, maybe it's better chance. Yes. What was your question? Can we know? Well, I asked it if I was going to fly somewhere romantic soon, and I'm going to Paris tomorrow. <laughs> You're going to Paris? <laughs> perhaps. It said yes. Be oh, I know. It said perhaps yes because we've got friends here who've already left Heathrow and not arrived here. So, <laughs> just thought you'd tell me. Who knows? You may be in touch with one of them now. So, um, would anyone else like to know anything at all, or should we ask it the ultimate question? We can ask it the ultimate question. What will win the Grand National next year? <laughs> Something we're all interested in, yes, okay. What will win the Grand National next year? The spirits join here and say, A. A. Ah, now, ah, yes, A-H, yes. And it will, of course, now, 
Spella, um, the name of the winner of the Grand National next year. What will win a H O? Yes. Aho. Ah. Aho. H O R S. Yes, very good. A a horse. Oh, come on. <laughs> a horse will win. The, yes, but what is it called? I mean, that's what we want. A horse. I mean, we, we like the name of the horse. C, yes. A. A horse. C A. L. L again. A horse called. A horse called. I hope you're all tuned in at home on this because a horse called yes a horse called what a horse called oh damn the spirits of blessedness just when it was getting to the interesting peak isn't that a shame but there it is the planchette can you just take that there take it and that give it to somebody over there and let the lady have her seat back now um over here now i'd like to explain one more item um because this is going to be a little special we really had a bit of fun with the Ouija board, but now we're going to do what is known as a living and dead test. Now, a living and dead test is a strange thing in the world of mental magic. This, the, well, you can see what they are, the little plastic boards on which we have pinned a piece of paper. Please pass them round, hand them out, it doesn't really matter. Keep one for yourself if you want, I don't care. And uh, would you like one over there somewhere and another one over there, it doesn't matter who. Would you like one, sir? Thank you very much. And you all can see you've got a piece of paper and here we've got a bowl of pens. Please just help there like that. Now I'm going to tell you what we're going to do. I would like um, one of you, uh, you if you wouldn't mind, sir, I want you to think of the name of someone who has passed on. Someone, nobody write anything yet. Someone who was so close to you at one time in your life, maybe you loved them, or maybe you just knew them very well. It can be somebody who looked after you as a child, it can be someone, but preferably someone who passed over some time ago, so there is no recent grief. We don't want to upset anybody on the show. Good. Now, once you've got that name fixed in your head, I want you to print it quite clearly, because we may later show it to a camera, maybe, uh, across the middle of your board and your paper. And would you do me a favour? Everybody else, right across the middle of the board and the paper, just print the name of someone you know is alive. Now, while you do that, I will turn away. Now, print as quickly as you can the name of somebody dead on one, the gentleman I asked, and live on everybody else. Once you've done that, unclip the pieces of paper and crumple them up into a tiny ball, a tiny ball of paper, and drop it in the glass bowl in the centre of the table. Now, once you've got that written, dropped in there, I can turn back round. Has everybody done that? Everybody printed? Everybody crumpled it up? Good, good. Drop them in there. And once they're dropped in there, we just clear the centre of the table and, in fact, all the spare parts off the table will have all of this and the pens and everything because Debbie's going to bring in a rather large tray. I think, Debbie, you might be better off. We'll keep those in vision. Keep, keep the tray. Can you just get it in there, sweetheart? I know that's heavy. OK. Now, what I want you to do, you're near the bowl there. Would you drop them on one at a time into, into the bowl? Drop, drop them in, please. Drop them into each one. All right, drop them in, quick as you can now, as they're going round any one you like into any one you like, okay? Now, once you've got them all inside there, this is what we do. We gather our hands on here, quickly now we're going to contact the spirits. Quickly, just like this, everybody touch the table, that's really good. And we're going to ask the spirits to eliminate, eliminate the living. Good, the spirits have eliminated the living leaving behind only one piece of paper, and that is it. You, sir, take that piece of paper out of there because I believe you did not write it. I want you to hold it high in the air and keep it inside your fist and let no one see what is written on the paper. You, sir, think of the person that you have just written the name of, but do not think of the name of the person. I want you to think of the actual um, person 
themselves. I want you to imagine them standing here next to me. I want you to imagine them standing next to me. Now what I'm going to do is this. I want you to imagine them standing next to me and telling me the name. Now it could be a male, it could be a female. Think of them as you possibly last saw them in a very happy time. But concentrate on the name and the, I think it is a man that is standing next to me. You must concentrate on that man as you knew him. Or that person, it is male, isn't it? Yes, it is. And what I want you to do is just think. Now ask him to tell me his name because I need to know his name. Don't say it, but just ask him to tell, tell me his name is, I believe, is uh, that. Uh, oh, it's a full name. You printed, I think, on your paper. You actually wrote two names, and I think it's got that on the end. You open your piece of paper, take it out and unfold it, out of your fist, unfold it and read it out very loudly. What is written on the piece of paper? John Andrews. John Andrews. Was that the name you wrote? And standing next to me, you saw John Andrews. He told me his name. Stop this devilry! Seize him! Here is diabolic magic such as I have never seen. Thy coven is powerful, conjurer. But so am I, for I am the Witchfinder General, charged with the destruction of all who practice the malefic arts. Send him hence. I shall escape. I shall. You may try, sorcerer, you may try. And now it is time for all gathered here to witness the punishment of the condemned. All who decline to follow shall be declared a witch and suffer eternal damnation. Come, follow me, witness and tremble! Send him to the stake! Unto me, brethren, I say, all malignant witchery must cease before heathen bedevilments can conjure forth the Prince of Darkness this All Hallows' Eve and place our very souls in jeopardy. I call upon the powers of light to dispel the unclean spirits that dwell in this satanic place and with this vial of holy water, I sanctify this ground in nomine patre fide spiritus sancti. It is done. Come forth, brethren, come forth. Witness and tremble. Enough. 
Here stands the architect of this procession of enchantments. His cabalistic guilt proves beyond true human imagination. So my course is clear. He must suffer the fate of all condemned as witches and perish in the flame of God's holy fire.